Well, the years start coming and they don't stop 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 coming. Hello everybody and welcome to a brand new episode of A Ogre Till It's Over. I'm usual host Will, and with me is my good buddy Matt Serafini. How you doing, Matt? Hey Will. How's it going? It's good to see you. Hey, it's great to see you too, Matt. And of course, also with us is my other good buddy, Chris Sheridan. How you doing, Chris? Just fine, Will. This isn't strange at all. <laughs> now, I'm sure our longtime listeners are very excited about an all new season of Ain't Ogre Totes Ogre, even though we originally ended it just over a year ago, promising never again to return. That's right, Will. I'm not sure what I'm doing with my life anymore. <laughs> Me too, Matt. You guys hear something? Sounds like someone is running up the stairs all mad and confused. Hmm. Well, Chris, that might just be a metaphor for how mad and confused our listeners must feel right now, because we've yet to reveal the film we've been watching and discussing once a month for the rest of the year. You do the honors, Matt. That's right, Will. I'm not sure what I'm doing with my life anymore. No, Matt. I mean, what movie are we talking about? Huh? Oh, right. We're discussing Cheaper by the Dozen with Steve Martin, which came out in 2003. Hey, what the heck are you three up to? Wait, John Negroni? My co-host from Cinemaholics? What the f*** are you doing here? I should be asking you guys that question. As you can see, I'm both mad and confused. And a little sweaty. And stinky. <laughs> yeah, John, sweaty much? What are you talking about, Will? You're making jokes that sound like they were written in 2003. Anyway, forget all that. The three of you aren't even supposed to be doing this right now. It Ain't Ogre Till It's Ogre was canceled by David Zaslav, the CEO of Warner Brothers, over a year ago. Hmm, looks like you're a little out of the loop, John. Well, aren't you and John podcast friends? Doesn't he even know what's going on? Well, Matt, you have to remember that people who make podcasts together aren't really friends. And that goes extra for me and John. Right, makes sense. Sorry, John, I forgot to tell you what happened. See, you know how David Zaslav is a terrible CEO and is currently burning down Warner Brothers to the ground as we speak? Of course, we talk about it all the time. Well then, John, you might also be aware that Zaslav has been threatening to delete the entire show as a tax write-off. And that, of course, means we can't stop recording the podcast, otherwise no one will know if our podcast is truly ogre. Which it is. Very much so. Guys, I know Warner Brothers is in dire straits right now, but you don't need to be shilling content for them just to stay afloat. Making more and more episodes of something people aren't asking for just because you're worried your previous achievements will be forgotten? You're not Sony Pictures Entertainment. Wow, John, that was beautiful. Wait, everything John just described reminds me of a movie that just came out. Really? It just made me hungry. Well, come with me, guys. Let's have a cookout and, and we'll talk about a movie together for fun as friends. Nice try, John. But as podcast friends, naturally. Now, worth a shot. Nice. A New York City cookout. And here I am flipping burgers and narrating what I'm doing for some reason. Matt, calm down. You're pressing the juices out of the patties. Cool your jets, Chris. Hey now, Matt. We're podcast friends here. Drink this Pepsi Cola. It'll make you feel better. Okay. But only if you hand me the can with the label facing me. All right, guys. Now that we're all feeling a little better and getting some fresh air... How about we just uh, talk about a new movie? Like Cheaper by the Dozen 2003 with Steve Martin? No thanks. Everybody knows that when I get invited to an episode of Cinemaholics, which this pretty much seems to be, we're either talking about a Muppets movie, a weird December release movie no one watched, or something vaguely related to Spider-Man. Or Cheaper by the Dozen 2 with Steve Martin. Don't forget animated Scooby-Doo movies. Wait, Matt, did, did you say something vaguely related to Spider-Man? I sure did, John. But it's 2024. It's not like there aren't tons of Spider-Man related movies coming out all the time almost every year for the rest of our lives. Are you guys high right now? Madam Web just came out. Oh, that's right. With Dakota Johnson and Emma Roberts. Hey, maybe we should just talk about Madam Web. Everyone's been looking forward to it. Like that Catwoman movie from 2004. Chris, are you okay? You sure don't look happy. Is it because I just smashed the burger with the Nokia phone? No, I mean, it's it's not just that. I'm just a little bummed that you guys didn't want to talk about Cheaper by the Dozen with Steve Martin. Sorry, Chris, but to be honest, I never really wanted to talk about it in the first place. Yeah, me either. I'm not sure what I'm doing with my life anymore. I hear what you guys are saying, but it's just... Well, how do you delete somebody who has never existed? 
Chris, I think I see the problem here. You're a little upset because the three of us wacky teens are doing our own thing, getting into trouble. Then one day, John, who is older than us, showed up in our lives and forced us to do a movie review for fear of being murdered. Will's right, Chris. We're not just talking about a movie. We're talking about a web that connects us all. Like Mark Web? Exactly. So, so should we just like review the movie now? or? Well, yeah, first I need to narrate it. And then the opening of Cinemaholics happened. Welcome once again to Cinemaholics, the major motion podcast, where we talk about the biggest and best films coming to theaters and swinging online. From the San Francisco Bay Area, I'm John Negroni, film editor for InBetweenDrafts.com. And for Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, he's a freelance film writer, and he's he's your friendly neighborhood, Will Ashton. Hey, what up? I like this idea of much like there's a multiverse with Spider-Man and other Marvel characters. There's a, a multiverse out there where Ain't Ogre, Tilt's Ogre is just still kind of happening. I'll bet interlocked with uh, Cinemaholics. It makes me feel better about uh, the state of the, the, the podcast industry and my friends. <laughs> Whoa, speaking of friends... Will, you should introduce our two guests because, you know, they're your old co-hosts. That's true. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'd be surprised at this point if you've been listening this far, if you don't know who our guests are. But nevertheless, you hopefully know my two friends here. It's Matt Serafini and Chris Sheridan, my four co-hosts on A Ogre to It's Ogre. Hey, guys. Hello. How are, how are hey, y'all doing? Good. Glad to be here. Pretty good. Now, Will, when you came to me and you were like, well, if we're talking about Madam Webb, well, actually, no. Originally, you were like, oh, John, you're not going to watch Madam Web because you missed your screening. So you you asked Chris and Matt to kind of come in and, and save yeah. the day. Yeah, I mean, much like the web that Madam Web connects everything with, I knew that, you know, it was a given that I had to reach out to Matt because he's our resident Spider-Man expert and he would be able to make at least some sense of whatever the hell this movie is. Because I don't even really know who Madam Web is really is outside of this movie like i i have a vague uh, idea I'll, I'll clear it all up don't worry all right i figured great, that's why I, I knew it was in good hands if matt was with me but then i was thinking about it, obviously and i was like well if we're talking about a film that takes place in 2003 and has the sort of bizarre nonsensical creative adaptation decisions who better than someone who is permanently living in 2003 by rewatching the cat in the hat multiple <laughs> times a year like my good friend chris sheridan so there you go. Yeah. So I was like, you know, it's a little bit of a perfect harmony in a way. It felt like if there was any movie outside of like a new Shrek or Puss in Boots movie to reunite the boys, it seemed like this was the one to do it. I appreciate that the reason for bringing me on was that I'm stuck in 2003 watching Cat in the Hat and not that I would be inextricably drawn to this trash ass movie <laughs> and want to talk about it. I feel like it's got to be a little of both, but that is <laughs> it's pretty funny. So yeah, Madam Web, it is yet another kind of Spider-Man adjacent movie. So I'll I'll try to set up the cinema side of this, and I know Matt's gonna go into the lore. But for those of you who are just kind of curious, right? There's the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and then there's like there are other kind of Marvel things that aren't really associated with the MCU. And this would probably take too long to describe in its entirety. But essentially, if you've watched, you know. Spider-Man Homecoming, Spider-Man Far From Home. That's a movie that is being made by Sony, but it takes place in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and it has a lot of creative input from the Marvel Studios branch. But Sony yeah. has owed, owned the rights to Spider-Man for a long time. So the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies from the early 2000s and the Andrew Garfield movies and a lot of the stuff since. So Morbius and Venom, both of the Venom movies. And those movies, ever since the MCU started doing the Tom Holland Spider-Man movies with the MCU, Sony's been like, well, we still have this property and we kind of want to flesh out our universe, but we also have this kind of weird contractual thing going on and there's a lot of weirdness around them having Spider-Man in anything except for Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse and Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse. So like these animated kind of Spider-Man properties. And there's more kind of in the web of all that stuff as well. Madam Web is kind of like the third of what I consider an unholy trinity. 
And uh, I'm not counting Venom 2 in that, but you know, the first Venom and then Morbius and then Madam Web, which are these kind of like these movies that like center on a character in the Spider-Man universe. In the case of Venom, Morbius and Madam Web, they're kind of like villainy anti-heroes, essentially, uh, depending on whatever comic you're reading. And I know, Matt, you're going to kind of help us get you know acquainted with Madam. I only know Madam Web from the animated Spider-Man series from the 90s, and then it's not much. But this movie stars Dakota Johnson as Madam Web, and I I don't even know how to set up this movie properly. Uh, S.J. Clarkson is the director, first time directing, and we have a bunch of screenwriters here, including S.J. Clarkson, a bunch of story credits, and the the cast includes Sydney Sweeney, who I think they kind of realized along the way is becoming like a bigger deal, so she's kind of featured more heavily in the marketing. Uh, Isabella Merced, I think she was the actor from uh, the Dora movies. Yeah, right? yeah. And she yeah, was in uh, Instant Family, I think. Instant Family. Wasn't yeah, because I don't want to get her confused. She, she used to go too. by Isabella. Well, she used to go by Isabella Monaire, but then she started going by Isabella Merced. I'm not sure why. Mm. So I was like, wait, do I have that right? Because the name, you know. Right. But yeah, yeah, she was also in Transformers last night. Yeah. But what was like? Oh, one thing I did want to kind of stress here is that I do think part of the beauty of these post Venom movies is that. I feel like everyone, if I recall correctly, in tw- 20 or 2018, had the idea of like, oh, making a Venom movie without Spider-Man is stupid. Like, why even do this? Like, this is Sony classically like, you know, just going to like get mud in their face and and kind of realize they made a really dumb decision. But in spite of the quality of the film, it made like nearly a billion dollars. So obviously Sony is like, oh, well, if you guys love that character. We should do all these other Spider-Man characters that aren't featuring Spider-Man. Right. Um, and the next one's going to be Craven with uh, yeah. Aaron Taylor Johnson. That's coming out later this year. But, and yeah. But yeah, I mean, obviously that first began with Morbius, which I still had never seen. I think just because I was kind of getting annoyed by the meme of it all. And also, I just don't like Jared Leto. It just didn't really look that interesting to me, even in a bad movie sort of way. But did you? I forget, John. Did you actually end up seeing? Oh, Morbius? I saw. I saw Morbius. You better believe that I saw Morbius. It was Morbin time for me in that movie theater. Yeah, the meme of it was pretty annoying. But it was the the thing that made it annoying was when Sony tried to like indulge it and be like, "We're in on the joke too," and then everybody was like, Just "Shut up, Morbius!" <laughs> like, no, you're not. Yeah. So Morbius technically bombed twice. Well, that I mean, yeah. I think that was the one <laughs> funny thing about it was. Sony misreading the vibe as like, oh, people are just loving Morbius. It's going to become like a new cult film. We should put it back yeah. in theaters. And the internet obviously being what it is, it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you should do that. Yeah, we, we are going to all come out to see it. And then <laughs> yeah, it's bombing yeah. twice. Yeah. The other thing, too, is that like Sony didn't really do much to to signal that they were in on the joke. They just re-release it in theaters. Like they should have done like they a TV spot. Tweets. Jared Leto had a script of Morbius 2, it's Morbin time or something like that. He yeah, there's uh, a whole short video there of him memes. reading a script. Yeah, the title. The Leto thing was really I mean, I think it was kind of dead already, but that was like the stake and the heart, if you will, of the of the Morbin time meme. But well, yeah. I'm, I, I, yeah. I'm proud real, to real say quick. I also saw it I, in theaters. <laughs> oh, perfect. Man, what a movie. What, a, what an experience. Celeste O'Connor is also in the movie from uh, Selling the Spades. And then Tahar Rahim plays the villain, if you can call him that. Uh, he's been on some like, you know, soap operas, I think. I wasn't super familiar with him. He was and in then, Narcos, uh, I think. No, no, the the spider guy was in Narcos. OK, I was going to say. But then also Mike Epps, Emma Roberts and Adam Scott, which I'll just put it out there. Like Adam Scott was like the only person in this movie who I think was like genuinely okay with being there. Uh, but anyway, uh, I don't know. I, I I I felt like his entire performance felt deeply ironic in a way that like I mean I don't yeah, know if kinda. it was intentional or if it was just kind of like like you can hear it as time, he reads the lines. He's just like, it just, what am I doing here? I'll do it. Just it. feel like every day he just kind of expected production to shut down and like he never expected the movie to like be made so he's just like yeah of course i'm uncle ben yeah that's what i'm I'm doing <laughs> yeah he's um, Parker. right uh-huh. but uh, i do gotta say i, I think it is fitting to bring uh, the boys on as well because i mean i've mentioned this i think elsewhere on the show but you talking you two to me is one of the biggest inspirations for 
A ogre totes ogre, and that's of course um, Scott's podcast with uh, Scott. Ackerman, Turn so. off the dark. Yeah, that's one of the best. Messages. I actually wore my. I not even making that connection. I wore my Spider Man Turn Off the Dark T shirt to Madam Web on Sunday oh, really? when I saw it. I did. Oh, yes. boy. that just speaks to how much you like that shirt. Yeah. It's a great shirt. It's it's a collector's item. <laughs> I got it <laughs> on Broadway when I saw the show. Boy. <laughs> So the movie basically follows Dakota Johnson as the daughter of a woman who is researching spiders. And these are spiders that maybe finish, sort of finish the line in the Amazon. Finish the line. <laughs> I think you'll have to do it for me. Chris. <laughs> she was researching the spiders in the Amazon right before she died. A line that's um, woefully not in the actual movie. <laughs> There are some lines that did that really stuck out to me that were in the movie. Like, you know, when, when the villain kind of wakes up and the, the girl in the bed next to him is just like, oh, that must have been some nightmare. And he was just like, it was no vision or it was no nightmare. I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the villain has yeah. some insanely <laughs> out of pocket lines that I like. I, I was love, just can't wait. I mean, it's a mild spoiler, but. You know, like, obviously that whole scene's going on. And she's, like, oddly very agreeable about, like, uh-huh, yeah. And then, you know, he kills her. And I, and when I saw the movie with my roommate, Jim, I was just, like... Because that whole, that whole scene is terribly ADR'd. So I was imagining... Yeah. Like, Every as he's, scene like, look, with him. That whole character. Yeah, the scene yeah, that where whole he's character. wearing a mask. And you just know... You can't see the dialogue. You could tell it's ADR. It's right. The, but, he, uh... Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll get to him later. Sorry, yeah. we'll go ahead. I was just going to say, like, as like you see, like, you know, an exterior ending shot of like him looking at the dead body. I was just imagining like someone ADR like, oh, and by the way, thank you for the sex. That was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be my headcanon now. So basically, Dakota Johnson plays this daughter of like a the scientist in the Amazon who was researching spiders right before she died. And something about these spiders giving powers and she dies and she's pregnant. But so she has her baby with a bunch of like Amazonian spider people. Again, this is before Spider-Man. Like th- this is completely unrelated theoretically to Peter Parker and all of that. Uh, I mean, unless the spiders are from like the spiders they were experimenting on were from that place, I guess. Not to be general, I guess, or sexist or what have you, but. I, I do find it fascinating. You mentioned, yeah, S.J. Clarkson direct this. It's her first film. I mean, she, uh, I think, has done a lot of TV before this. But anyway, like a woman directed this film, and it has potentially the most inaccurate pregnancy birth scene that I've ever seen in a film. <laughs> like to the point where, like, the body is like I, I was joking, just like imagining like, shploop, and it's just like the baby's out, like obviously a very fake baby doll with like no umbilical cord or anything. It's just like. Whoop, Hey, look at this. The baby's here. You know? <laughs> yeah, I I do not lay this film at the feet of S.J. Clarkson. You're right. It has made a bunch of great TV stuff and it shows that I've really loved. It literally directed an episode of Succession, you know? So, like, let's be real. Like, a lot of what's going on here has to be related to Sony. That's my opinion. I mean, I don't know. But anyway. I mean, can we briefly mention the writing credits of the writers yeah so uh the guys who did morbius matt sazama and, and burke sharpless uh also claire parker has has a credit which i think because you know claire parker peter parker anyway but no these are the guys they made morbius they made uh gods of egypt uh they wrote dracula untold and the last uh, witch hunter i i i know you're probably being ironic or sarcastic with the the parker thing but i do always think about how I'm like 85% sure that Mark Webb directed the amazing Spider-Man because his last name is Webb. Sure. And they're just like Webb spider. 500 days of summer. Right. (laughs) This is it. But yeah. So basically Dakota Johnson has these weird powers. I guess she can kind of see the future or sometimes the future like replays or redoes itself. It, it doesn't really follow anything kind of consistent. It's just sort of like, script logic but essentially she sees like these three teenagers are gonna get killed by this spider dude who i forget who it was but somebody called him spider spawn which i thought was pretty great but uh, essentially these three teens are gonna grow up to one day become three spider women who will kill him 
And so Dakota Johnson takes it upon herself to like mother hen them and keep them safe. And it's basically a Terminator movie. And one of the first things that people have said about this movie that has gobsmacked them something else is that like the trailer kind of makes it look like it's a spider people movie with like Sydney Sweeney and Isabel Merced and Celeste O'Connor being like these superhero spider people and Dakota Johnson's Madam Web being like their leader. Literally like everything we see with them in costume is in the trailer. Yeah. Like it it's completely deceptive. And I I don't know. Like I, I don't know like who delivered this script and was like, here it is. I have to assume that they were given about 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. I mean, actually like being serious, they probably had like less than a week. Like I don't well, know what was going on with the production of this, but I find it fascinating. If we really want to get like into the suspicious of it all, like there are there's some rumors of what the original storyline of this movie was, which causes it to make a little bit more sense. But I don't know, about, that's like heavy spoiler uh, stuff. So is this related to like why it's in 2003? Yeah. And OK, that's what I thought. I was just going to say, you know, thinking about what, what John said about like how like mother heading this film, I was like, in my mind, watching this movie, I was like, finally, we got a Spider-Man movie for all the R.A.'s. That, you know, are just watching over their sorority sisters and can finally get a Spider-Man movie of their own. (laughs) Well, and didn't also Dakota Johnson, she said in like an interview, she's like, oh, there were so many rewrites. I can't even tell you what they were. Yeah. And I think that there's also like the rumors that it was she originally thought it was going to be like a Marvel movie, like an MCU movie. And I uh, didn't know. No doubt. Or. Yeah. I think Sydney Sweeney, from what I can tell, also thought the same thing. Yeah. And I think they Dakota sure Johnson deceived. Yeah, Dakota Johnson fired her agent like a week after the first trailer dropped. Mm-hmm. As she should. Her whole team, um, I think, if if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, she's with a new firm now. I, I mean, I firm- think. I'm sorry. I was just gonna say that you gotta think like there's no way that she was ever passionate about this film. Like it was probably COVID. Like you know, the future of the industry was unclear. She was obviously after Fifty Shades of Grey, steering more towards you know, independent or art relate art house kind of films. And they were, her agent was just kind of like, look, it's a sure thing. Superhero movies are really hot right now. Just do and you can just whatever, you know, success this fun this makes, you can fund that to do any number of weird projects you want. So like she was kind of just, you know, a holding her nose and probably doing it. And then Lil Lucino, the superhero bubble burst in 2023. And then here comes Madam Webb. A movie that I think no one, from what I can tell, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for S.J. Clarkson, but like, it doesn't feel like anyone involved with this film was like, this is a story that needs to be told. Everyone just kind of feels like, all right, I guess we're doing this, you know, just kind of throughout, like not dissimilar to how I feel about Scott in this film. But yeah, just this whole press tour just feels like Dakota Johnson scorching earth just being like, look, I like I can't say I didn't, I never wanted to do this, but like, y'all can read between the lines. Like I... I I have nothing but contempt for this movie and all the ways that you've tried to like memify it. And I just want to make my movies with like Elaine May and stuff. I don't know why you guys are, are doing this to me. <laughs> I want to, I want to stress that I'm a hundred percent, hundred and twenty percent on Dakota Johnson's side in all things these days, because I, her press tour has been cathartic, honestly, and genuinely like, I hope she's having fun. I, I, I doubt she is, but like, it, it's been something else to see this happen. But yeah, it's what you're saying, Will. Basically, Sony was like, we want to do our first kind of like female-centric Marvel film, right? And so they picked Madam Web for that. I think their line of thought was like, maybe Venom was successful because it's kind of it's it, it has a spidery title. <laughs> and so I think that they're just, instead of picking any villain like Silver Sable or you know a lesser known kind of female villain, Black Cat, something like that, they were like, well, if it's kind of related to Spider-Man, people are dumb. They're just going to watch it because it's like, look, it's Ben Parker. Here's my money for the ticket. So I think that that was their their line of rationale or whatever. Yeah, they, they hired like, the Morbius guys before Morbius came out. But I mean, I think that they had to know that the writing was on the wall for that movie by then. I know that they were still flailing with like, well, Michael Keaton is in it and whatever. But uh, they, they hired those guys. They originally were going to have Charlize Theron or Amy Adams to do it. But then they kind of just like landed on Dakota Johnson, like, yeah, like end of 2021. So, yeah, around when the industry was still kind of like, 
not sure what we're doing here. Like, I think Eternals was coming out around that time, maybe. But anyway, for people who don't know what Madam Web is, and they're kind of like, who am I? Matt Serafini, I mean, I feel like, could, could you could you give us a, a primer? Do, do, you, do you know what a, what a Madam Web is? Yeah, I can give you a little rundown. And I actually, it, it's really funny that they chose this character to be their first female-led movie because madam web is effectively a plot device of a character like she doesn't she's not she is she's more of a story engine than she is character she exists basically to tell peter parker what is like going to happen to him that he needs to stop honestly john i'm glad that you are familiar with her from the animated tv show because that's pretty much what she is in the comics as well. She's just this old psychic woman who is blind and paralyzed and she's connected to the web of life. And she, I mean, like she shows up in, yeah, (laughs) she shows up in stories. Like I said, to tell Spider-Man what he needs to know. So like a recent use of her that would, that people would maybe recognize is the original spider verse comic event. She like warns Peter something big is coming on the web of life. <laughs> you know, it's so yeah. It, Isn't she also very, a mutant? Technically, like an X-Men mutant. Not part I'm of the I'm not X-Men, as sure but. about that. It's possible. Um, okay. I I thought that, but it has been a while since I was more There's a couple Madam Webs too, because I mean Yeah, there's a DC one, isn't there? Well, no, I mean in Marvel, like there's oh, a, okay because eventually the original Madam Web dies, and oh no, then because she's old. Je- Jennifer, I think it's Jen Walters, or no, not Jen Walters, that's the Hulk, Julia Carpenter. Thank you, Julia Carpenter takes over as Madam Web, and that version of the character's appearance is largely what Dakota Johnson's mm. portrayal is based on. So you're yeah. saying basically like she in the comics is like the Oracle and the Matrix sequels, just kind of like someone that yep. Spider-Man goes to and is just like, sort of, oh, okay. yeah, and and kind of has like, don't trust her vibes. Yeah, because, yeah, she there are a few scenes in the animated series and I've seen them kind of like shared as memes of where he's like yelling at her very yeah, dramatically. Stay out of my life or whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, mean, one- I mean, she does. She yeah. is to be trusted. Like she is right. And she is an ally. That, that's the other thing too. She's not an enemy of Spider-Man really. It's just that like she makes him go through a hard time sometimes. So he doesn't like her very much. Yeah. He shoots the messenger a little bit. He web shoots mm, the yeah. messenger, but she like, I feel like, yeah. Cause the stuff I remember her from the animated, she's like, Peter Parker, pick an army to fight this battle on another planet. And then he picks mm-hmm. like Captain America and stuff. And then there's just, like this other thing where he's like, Peter Parker. This is Iron Man. It's like mm. it, it, Madam Web is kind of like this multi, not multiverse character, but kind of like she she's like a watcher, but not the watcher where she kind of tries to orchestrate mm-hmm. things. So I kind Which of was is, wondering, well, yeah, when they announced they were going to do Madam Web, I kind of figured I was like, oh, OK, maybe Sony is using this as their Doctor Strange to tie all of their weird disconnected movies uh, together. Exactly. So I was like, but, oh, is this going to be how Sony <laughs> tries to bridge the gap between their Sony exclusive stuff and their other stuff? Mm-hmm. But mm. to the credit, like, I think that would have been really lame because I, a lot that a lot of people are just multiversed out. And so I think it was kind of nice that they were like, yeah, yeah, no, 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 forget that. If that I was mean, I got to say. I mean, that makes a lot more sense to me because watching the film and like Dakota Johnson, Madam Webb is just kind of like, I can see in the future. It's like, oh, wow. Like, what's going to happen? Like, well, I can only see five seconds into the future sometimes. I don't really control it. I was like, this power kind of sucks. <laughs> like, like, you know, like, it's not like a very like, I mean, I guess like she made it work, but like, it's not like a very good superpower. It's just kind of like. Yeah, like she doesn't really it doesn't feel like she has a lot of agency about it or like a lot of control over it. So that also kind of compounds to make it a weird like this is our female centric, like, you know, more feminist superhero movie when it's just like, yeah, she can like kind of figure out the powers. And then I feel like, I don't know, like so much stuff I feel like happened off screen as far as like her ability to control this power, because like she spends two thirds of movie like barely being able to 
figure it out. And then suddenly by the last action scene, she's like a pro, like a master. I was like, how'd she like handle these powers so well? Like, like, I just feel like there's a whole lot there that just got cut out. You're also talking about the powers as if there's any consistency to what they are. <laughs> That's <laughs> it. Which they they I it. hope this movie makes people appreciate the Marvels better because at least they had a yeah. montage. <laughs> I need to see that one still. The powers do allow her to yell get down about 15 times. No. Yes. It's weird. It's like, why did they decide it to be Terminator? I don't know. But okay, I'm going to say something nice about this movie. Here it, go- here it comes. Dakota Johnson in this, I, at the very least, I kind of think like her as a protagonist, I kind of like how unlikable she is. Like there actually is like kind of the makings or like the loose oh, yeah. framings of an arc there where she's kind of socially awkward. It's funny how so she's socially awkward. Uh, and there are a couple of scenes where like literally Bed Parker just being like, I met someone. She's just like just staring at him like she doesn't care. <laughs> and I'm just like, yeah, I like her because I like how she's a bit like there's just something with her. And so well, that kind of kept me interested. I mean, she is supposed to be kind of cagey and they don't really make it subtle that like she's like a stray cat <laughs> at the beginning of this movie. A stray's uh, got to stick together. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought uh, it was like I, I, that cat could be like Catwoman, you know, it's like it's just, right. <laughs> this movie and that movie. Yeah. I mean, I can't honestly tell if these Sony Marvel movies are filled with contempt for their audience or just like contempt stupidly naive about like what these movies should be. I think it's probably a mix of both. Like I'm assuming like Avery Arad, I don't know if he produced this one, but like I feel like no. he's he's just a very like sincere but probably kind of dumb f- comic book fan who just like has very particular ideas about what comic book movies should be and he's like not as keyed in as Kevin Feige. And then, you know, like Amy Pasquale who's just kind of like, look, I don't know, like people like Spider-Man when we make those Spider-Man movies, people show up, so just do that again, you know. <laughs> I do like how <clears throat> socially inept that Madam Webb is. Like the child of the woman she saved from the car accident gives her this really nice crayon picture. She's like, "What the hell am I supposed to do with this?" <laughs> I don't know, dude. Put it on your fridge or whatever. And then throw it away later. Like <laughs> throw it away. Yeah, Adam Scott's like just, just uh, throw the it away birthday later. scene. No notes. The, or not the birthday, the, the baby shower. The baby shower. No, no, no the, the, there were the no baby shower. Scene. She's perfect. like, my mom died in childbirth. It's like, what of all the things you could say at a baby shower? <laughs> and like Emma Roberts' face, like we're behind that Mountain Dew code red. Yes, we do have to talk about the constant references to the they they really want you to understand it's 2003 to like an obsessive Just in case degree. you forgot, it's like, 2003. Like, Look at this Beyonce album. And yeah. like, like, I, there were just moments where I was like, what do you want from me? <laughs> like, what, what, I mean, why do you want this? I feel well, like do the, that right. I feel like the movie thinks the audience is like Stephen Tobolowski's character from Memento that just like constantly forgets what's happening and needs to emphasize in every single scene that it takes place in 2003 for some reason, which when you're watching a movie isn't really ever clear. Like, why does this need to be a period piece? Is this supposed to connect? to another spider-man movie if so well i think it's trying to which, say it's a prequel to because like spider-man's not alive yet so like well sure yeah 2020 yeah but I it can't, i'm I, genuinely that with how on the nose a lot of the 2003 jokes are though i'm genuinely surprised that there's no point where a character is like you know it has only been two years since 9 11 well they, I know, they have the poster <laughs> of, they have the never forget poster and oh, did they yeah. i missed that they yeah, do okay. in the firehouse, which makes sense. Good. Like I did. Well, good. I mean, yeah. Or the, they're not the firehouse, but like they're EMT. In so the like, it's like in the hospital, like wait, waiting room, like or something in like the little eating area. But you mess with um, one of us. You mess with all of us. No, I mean, I was I, I made this joke already on Letterboxd, but I do like to imagine like the Sony boardroom meeting where they're thinking about how they can reference that 2003 and they had to come to the decision like. Well, we got to make sure we reference American Idol more than 9 11 because 9 11 is going to make people sad. And it's also going <laughs> to make you wonder. I got to get home to watch Idol. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of it's 9/11. also It's also going to make you wonder why the villain didn't do anything to prevent 9 11 if he had these powers. Not that I imagine he would, but like he kind of. Yeah, I don't know what he, why he's a villain, right? Like he murders right. people to get the spider and then he makes we a don't bunch know. of money. But what else is he We don't he know do? anything about Ezekiel Sims. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, he's like, just kind is, of like I do this how for is my he wealthy? family. And then so if I, I may go into comic lore again, this time about Ezekiel. Oh, I mean, there is a lot of lore surrounding Ezekiel, but as someone who's read all of Spider Man, this movie's portrayal of him is actually pretty spot on. His his he's visual like, look in the flash forward is very accurate. Yeah, he, he he's, he's more of a villain with the Spider Society, right? Like Silk and, and that's yeah, kind of, yeah, exactly. He's like he's like a prepper, and he's just this he's this weird old guy who just shows up and starts like giving guidance to Spider Man, and then like several several issues later, it's revealed that he also has Spider Man powers, and he's like connected to the web of life. But I have to say portraying him as a Neil Breen esque character is like a stroke of genius. <laughs> Man. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, he's, I mean, sorry. I'm generally fascinated to know how many lines he had initially because he, as we mentioned already, I'm pretty sure like 85% of his lines were 80 yard into the film. Yeah. I think it's a hundred. I would be surprised if there are any lines here that is actually him. It's like, Oh, it's in the in the scene in the bed. You can tell because like the audio shifts, like when you're talking in bed, <laughs> like you can like it's it's very much like, you know, like I was in the Amazon and then like you like hear him talk in the next right. moment. And it sounds like, oh, he's actually in the room talking to somebody because it's like a little bit quieter and whispering as if like, oh, yeah, he just had sex it is just like talking to this woman he loves and not like spouting out. 5,000 lines of exposition to this lady. <laughs> well, there are the Imagine scenes she... where he's with Zosha Mehmet from Girls and like literally you can tell they had to have done something because like I he mean, keeps talking off screen and then it'll just like yeah. linger on her. Right. And it's so awkward because you're like, oh, I know what so, you're doing. I gotta say real quick, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. I just want to make sure I say this. Sasha Mehmet has the best job in Hollywood in this movie. She never sits up, like she only sits down <laughs> In this whole movie is just she dictating never even things. Has to stand. When does she go to the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Depends. Um, sorry, what were you going to say, Matt? Well, I I don't know if it's too early to talk about. I mean, we're forty minutes into the conversation, but like the the rumors of what the original plot was that seemed to make sense. Am I allowed to talk about what that is? Oh, naturally. Or, yeah, I wouldn't. I think we can just go me. into. I don't think we okay. need to stop. I think we need to worry yeah. about spoilers at all. Yeah, do people right. not? Do so, people need a formal review of this movie? I don't think so. No, yeah. The, the, so the third act of this movie, as we all know, involves Ezekiel Sims is trying to catch the Spider Girls and kill them. And also, while this is happening, <laughs> we're also surrounding the birth of Spider Man. <laughs> is is the holy event that it is? Well, uh, you know the the nativity scene. That right. It, you know, for some reason that's tied up in all of this. And was, so my, my head I, cannon by the way is that come on guys, Ben Parker, he's really Peter's dad, isn't he? Let's read between. The I, lines. Yeah. Uh, be banged a sister. No, it's I a mean, it's a sister in law. Right. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, I, <laughs> they never show May. They never show. Yeah. I, I did. It's have like, I met thoughts. someone. Yeah. I bet right. you did. Yeah, I, I have plenty to say about that, though. I do want to say I was like in my head thinking like as a joke, like, ah, yes, like the three wise men, Sydney Sweeney, yeah. all that. But like, <laughs> it seems just dumb enough. Like that was an intentional decision on their part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, three wise like when the baby is actually born, I was like half expecting to be like, he's so cute. Let's call him Spider-Man. Right. Like, <laughs> well, I was yeah, thinking they're, about they're like that. Well, what are you uh, going to name the baby? Like, oh, uh, Richard wishes it was Richard. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> I was thinking about that during the baby shower scene. Like, I was mm -hmm. wondering if Madam Webb was just like, what's your what do you think the baby's going to be named? First name Spider, middle name Man, last name Parker. Yeah, that's oddly Ugh. specific. <laughs> yeah, so. The rumor of what was originally supposed to be the plot, which makes a little bit more sense with what the elements of this movie include, are that Ezekiel Sims is trying to prevent Peter Parker from being born. And right. so it was more directly Terminator. And 
Dakota Johnson has to get these women who are not yet the spider women to help stop him. Which makes way more sense. And yes. that's way more interesting. A concept. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, I think both concepts suck. <laughs> I, 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 oh, fully agreed as well. Oh, well, yeah. It, 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 it sounds like it an absolute shit ev- movie. Because like Peter Parker, it's like, it's, stop treating it like Jesus. He's like, not like just, an immortal figure. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like they uh, even butcher the great responsibility line in this. And it's just like kind of just stepping all over. When the you board. have, if you accept your responsibility, you will get superpowers. <laughs> That's basically <laughs> it. Which <laughs> feels like it's like they're trying not to do the exact line, but it completely mangles the intent of that sentiment. Yeah, it was like the MCU did it. Like when, you know, Tom Holland's Peter Parker kind of does like a, a teenage paraphrase of it that actually fits his character. You're like, yeah, you know, I get the sentiment. But then, yeah, in this movie, like, and there's also the part where <laughs> Dakota John, somebody's just like, oh, but you must have responsibility or something like that. And she's just like, unless you like, I forget how she even says it, but it's like toward the end of the movie. I have to admit something, guys. I did fall asleep during this movie. Okay. Oh, oh, I have to. I have to add it to my list. How? My That's, list. Uh, you, it was so interesting. <laughs> it was like around the time she goes to Peru to like Dakota Johnson does, and I was like in and out, like, and so like I kind of woke up during the finale. <laughs> Literally, like a big chunk of this movie. Apparently, I just like. I mean, gone. That would make. I think your a a bridge version of the film would make more sense as far as how the yeah. hell. She went all the way to Peru and came back in the course of like a day. I don't even know oh, if it's yeah. been 24 yeah, hours. She says, I woke up she says she's going to be gone for a week. Right. Yeah. She's there for a week. Yeah. Presumably. Yeah, but, and then, but like speaking of 9 11, how did she? Sure. Of course. How did she fly out to Peru and back without Ezekiel Sims detecting her? Well, she had a private plane. I mean, that, that, I mean, did I'm not going to give, they do show a private plane landing in Peru. I'm not going to give this movie. Yeah, I mean, I don't remember that part. I thought she's well, checking. Well, Sims wasn't really looking for her, right? He was looking for the three teenagers. I don't remember her being tracked. I guess that makes sense. But she, but she was also wanted for kidnapping the girls. Oh yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah, yeah. You got, you got, you that's got why, there. <laughs> Well, that's why I thought she got a private plane. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, this all happened off camera. But she convinced some, but like she bribed <laughs> somebody or another to. Give her a private plane. Which I mean, who is she taking? I mean, I would be this private jet action. Come yeah, on. I know. <laughs> This like just reminded me of one of my favorite shots of the movie, which is where they imply that nobody else is able to see Ezekiel whenever he's in his weird black Spider-Man costume. Yeah, yeah. And it's like this shot of a subway station and you just see him crawling <laughs> very slowly on the ceiling. And there's just like a couple people in the foreground just fully. Ignoring him. Well, it's even, such a like- bizarre shot. Hey, There's a little like, line of dialogue where she's like, "Is anybody else seeing this?" So yeah, I don't exactly. know what the deal is with that. Yeah. Also, <laughs> she wanted like, for abduction, and, and it's, yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> speaking of getting detected, like she also pries the license plates off the taxi cab and continues to use it. Like that won't get you pulled over, right? I, I was. She kind returns of to the scene of the accident, right? <laughs> in the taxi. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna say, well, for one, as far as the. What do we call it? Spawn Spider Man thing. In my in my head, Ken, it was just like everyone was just like, "Hey, it's New York. Oh, you see something crazy every day. Rats are eating <laughs> yeah, yeah. pizza. Bada well, bing. Come you to know. Brooklyn, <laughs> right? Welcome yeah. to Brooklyn." But I did want to. I know this is like five tangents from now, but I did want to say I I was really cackling to myself as we were talking about like, the great power comes great responsibility line when they're like eating fortune cookies. I have to assume there was some version of this film that. With great power comes great responsibility was on the fortune cookie. Hundred percent. Like, but bad, like, yes. but somebody, I like to imagine. Like, wait, stop! <laughs> Don't do that. Well, probably it was Adam Scott being like, "No, that's dumb." But I like to imagine a version of this film, you know, where for some reason Dakota Johnson, Madam Web, is like aware of how many Spider-Man movies there are, and like, you know, she was like, "Let me guess, something about responsibility," and he's like, "No, it says." Smile more, smile frequently. You're like just some, you know, dumb thing. Like, yeah, like, yeah, I don't know. I wish Adam Scott spoke the responsibility line from Amazing Spider-Man, where it's like. When you have power and you're being responsible for the man that you are, who could or may or may not be a spider. Yeah. (laughs) I've actually got it it pulled up. 
I've got it pulled up. Oh, hit me, there's hit a me. moment where <laughs> I was kind of wondering to myself, would this have been better if they had tried to make it a prequel to Amazing Spider-Man? Like, be a little bit more direct about it originally that? was yes yeah right because say, oh, that makes sense because like there has been like the talk right of like bringing andrew garfield back for one more and like it wouldn't be in 2003 if he hasn't been born yet it would be like i guess early 90s or something but well no, tom holland was born in 2001 or something like that it doesn't really oh. add up with 2003 but i do like the idea of adam scott aging i know I like the idea of Adam Scott aging into Martin Sheen. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I buy thought, it. Yeah, <laughs> I so certainly says, buy that. He says he yeah, believed no, if you could. Doing... What? Yeah. No. No. Oh, okay. I was going to do in the the Sheen line where he says he believed that if you could do good things for other people, you had a moral obligation to do those things. That's what at stake here, not a choice, responsibility. Which well I just said. love how that line twists itself into a dang pretzel trying not to be the actual iconic line. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I mean, obviously everyone quotes that line every day. So it, it has just as much <laughs> sentimental value for comic yeah. book fans everywhere. They like beat somebody on the basketball court and then they like whip out that line, you know, <laughs> like, OK, I, we had some fun, but let me just drop this on you. Yeah, not a good movie. I I didn't get to see the part where apparently I heard the Pepsi sign falls on the villain. Yes. I'm very curious, like how they defeat him in general, since like they don't have powers or anything except seeing they hit him with two different vehicles and then they blow up a a giant neon sign. What's that? They blow up a fireworks factory. Yeah. So it's pretty much the students logic. I wanted to talk Uh, about the Pepsi thing. Um, Oh, yeah. I was thirsty after the movie. I wanted a Pepsi. Oh, I, by the way, regal. by the way, I, I made a point to after the movie, I need to go to the grocery store and I saw Pepsi and I skirted all the way to the Coke section <laughs> just to spite having paid all this money for what I feel is an egregious. The cashier is for... like, why are you flipping me off? <laughs> like, right. and you're like, it's not to you. It's... Right. But yeah, I, I do love, you know, like there's that scene where she's underwater and the giant S comes and I thought like. Oh, that's some super, super dumb uh, foreshadowing for Spider-Man or something like probably Amy Pasquale. Have or the same thought. Amy yeah. Pasquale forgot that Spider-Man is not Superman. But but then, yeah, once you once you see the S in the billboard or whatever, the, the neon sign, it's just like, oh, boy. <laughs> so, yeah. So Pepsi features prominently in this movie as a as a product. It shows up in almost every scene. During the Welcome baby shower, yeah. During the baby shower scene, she's handed a, a can of Pepsi, and she's like, don't just drink beer, it. drink Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> she's holding it throughout the entire scene, and every she she comes very close to opening it like five times. She, she then she just runs her finger on the top of it, and I was like, if you not don't even open Dakota that Johnson wants to read goddamn <laughs> Pepsi can, I'm gonna freak out. <laughs> and then yeah, at the very end, there's the big the big I don't want to say fight, the big thing at the end. They go to a fireworks factory, which has already been established by Mike Epps as being a very dangerous setting because it's already burned down once in this movie. And they're setting off all the fireworks and causing explosions. And then, yes, after all is said and done, Ezekiel Sims fall. He plummets from the building and then he is crushed by the pee in Pepsi Cola. <laughs> I do think they should have pulled a, a page from Garfield, the movie. And much like Stephen Tobolowski, who I didn't anticipate to reference twice in this in this review, but yeah, what's uh, Tobolowski fan? I, I like I like in that movie as we all as all three of us refer, referring, of course, to Chris and Matt and myself. No, they the the they they have a pointed scene where Stephen Tobolowski is like asked, like, "What would you like, steak or lasagna?" He goes, "Steak." I hate lasagna, as if. To really emphasize that he's the villain of the movie, he is like the opposite. He's the anti Garfield. I feel like this movie should have also had the villain be like, you know, just he's at a restaurant or something and be like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, he like orders a Coke. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. Is Pepsi okay? Like, no. If the hell it thing, is. Right. If there's one <laughs> thing about me you need to know is that I will never drink a Pepsi Cola. As if to really be like, oh, he's the villain of the movie. Like, yeah, so you when know, a sign falls at him, you can be like, huh, take that. And then they oh. all go to Taco Bell and have Mountain Dew Baja Blast, which is new. What uh, if the what if the death by Pepsi was what his premonition was? 
That would have been like, better. He finishes you know, up with a, <laughs> he finishes up with a roll in the hay with with the NSA lady, and then he wakes up like, oh my god, I got killed by a Pepsi sign, and she's like, excuse me. Well, <laughs> I was imagining. Like <laughs> no, I was imagining more like like after like post coitus, like she goes to the fridge to get a drink because she's probably all sweat and sweaty and hot and bothered, and she like goes and she opens a Pepsi, and he's like, no, <laughs> like I'm sorry. I have a fear of Pepsi. It's going to kill me someday. And she'd be like, well, then why'd you have it in the fridge? <laughs> I just like him as a villain. I, like, what does he like? What does he do? Like, oh, is he like he's evil? He murdered people in the 90s or whatever. Or not the 90s, the 80s. I... But then he's just sort of he, he owns an apartment that's expensive. And I kind of yeah. thought it was like a back to future two thing where like because he can see so far into the future that like, I don't know if he like abuse that power to like, no, like, you know, scores or something for like betting purposes and like somehow like accrued money through like wall street or something. Just sounds cool. Well, we didn't ever get confirmation that he has any precognitive abilities beyond just having this nightmare where he gets killed by the spider women. Yeah, I guess you're right. Though so I do have an ADR also, that, huh? <laughs> I do. Uh, what if, like this philanthropist, and he's like he's kind, and he 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 has like twenty orphans that he adopted, and he uses mm. his independent wealth to make lives better for people, and then he has his dream. He's like, I'm gonna freaking kill those girls. I do have to say, like obviously we mentioned, he's haunted by this premonition, and the big climactic scene happens where he's like tied down by the the bolts, and Dakota Johnson very dramatically says like. You don't understand. I've been your future, which makes me wonder, like, just as he's about to get crushed by the P and Pepsi, be like, I, I, I know you're doing a metaphorical thing right now, but it was a very literal premonition. I saw very specifically these women were going to kill me. <laughs> like, I get you're and trying to do a thing, but like, it doesn't make a lot ADR of sense. Right. Yeah. As the sign is falling. <laughs> like, I want to get falling. what I signed up for. Like he's falling into the water, like I just don't want to really <laughs> <laughs> Well the, and there's a whole other thing of like so we don't know how like I guess like they get their powers or they become spider people because of Madam Webb. But then how would they have done that without Madam Webb? And exactly yeah. like that. So like it's I guess it's kind of like one of those things where he brought about his own undoing by trying to prevent it. It's a web of she, folly. Because if he never tried to kill the spider woman, he wouldn't have died at that fireworks factory. You just it's died the later. web of life. It's, yes, yeah. connects. They're going to become the spider woman still because they are. Well, it happens at that apartment. Why don't you just move? Yeah, why? That's I, I've seen that mentioned a lot of times. Like, why didn't he just move out of his place? Because that's where <laughs> the death happens. He seems to have a good <laughs> bit of money. Well, then he'd have to relocate Money's the no spider object. enclosure, and that sounds very well, expensive. I like to imagine he's like the ultimate New Yorker and being like, what, am I going to move to New Jersey? Forget about it. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> what am I, Tony Soprano? <laughs> Except he's Peruvian. <laughs> there's, also well, that he's moment, quite. <laughs> there's also that moment where she, after she says, the girls weren't your future, I am, or whatever. And then there's yeah, that, yeah. that really awkward crash zoom on her face. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of really weird editing stuff in this movie. The editing was so oh, weird because yeah. like, they they cut to them being in like the woods and so you're like is that central park like how does that and then you find out like 20 <laughs> minutes later it's new jersey you're like well i would have liked to have known that like how did you get the taxi there like what i mean yeah they? she just inexplicably has the taxi in the middle of the woods and also it takes dakota johnson longer to get from the middle of the woods yeah. to the restaurant mm. in the taxi than it does on foot at that yeah. point also, though when i saw that i was just like fine sure. <laughs> You already got my money. Plus, right. they, they leave the fire going when they go to the diner. There's, there's yes, a fire yes. burning I, in the woods. They, like, deliberately show that, yeah. and yeah, nothing comes of it. Which I don't know if that was supposed to imply that these are just young girls that don't really think about that kind of thing or what. But I, I think that's a little presumptuous to think of the script of, of actually consciously trying to do that. Matt, you'll appreciate this. I, I got to say the three teens, especially the whole time they're in that diner, these are Disney Channel original movie mm-hmm. early two thousands teens, like from the. I wouldn't even give them that much credit. To they the each have acting. exactly one personality trait, but it's like you go to saying where it's like things are about to get wild in this diner. <laughs> we're mm-hmm. gonna get onto the table and start dancing. Whoa! 
<laughs> it's great. There's I don't even think there's any adults in the diner. Like <laughs> behind the well, counter at one point, but the, it's like Max Keeble's big move at yeah. one point. Well, there is the trucker the that there is the Whoa. trucker that called the called nine one one or whatever. Yeah, they're they're uh, like yeah. a ha- they're like a handful of trucker guys. Which why mm-hmm. is the but news? They're like yeah. Why why is the news? This is what three or four hours after the yeah, he's reading a happened. newspaper and she's already in it. <laughs> And she's hey, already on the front page of the Daily Why is he Bugle. reading a newspaper at night? <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, I don't know if it's fair to call it a newspaper. I'm pretty sure that was a New York Post. Was it, I thought it was <laughs> oh, Daily Bugle. Okay. Oh, I don't know. I I was going to say, though, <laughs> Same uh, thing. I have to assume that this is a flying taxi because I think, if I recall correctly, didn't Zosh and Mamet, before they go in the woods, say, like, I'm going to be tracking all the bridges so I'll know like when they're le-. like she said something along the lines that she's going to track it. But there's no way she can go. They can't get out of the city to New Jersey without crossing a bridge. So, like, even if they like went through a toll booth, like when they, well, I guess if they paid cash. I don't know. I don't know how this works. It's more thought than the movie's. I mean, you're, at the yeah, very, you're putting too much. You're giving them too much credit. Yeah, the writers themselves would look at you right now and be like, "Stop! <laughs> like, this is it. This is enough." They would have been I, like. I think t- oh, yeah. I should have thought of that. Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> got us, Will. I think to bring it home, no one wanted to be in this movie. Clearly, no one wanted to make this movie except for people who just had dollar signs in their eyes. And Mm -hmm. if we're kind of in this weird sort of late stage superhero fatigue era, like this is going to be one of those footnotes, quite honestly, where people are going to be like, man, there was this movie that came out in 2024 called Madam Web. It's it's kind of be like like I've mentioned it a couple of times. It'll be kind of like what Catwoman was. You know, for Mm -hmm. like the late stage, you know, 90s stuff, even though it was 2004, in terms of like, we really don't know why we want to make a superhero movie or a comic book movie, except to just make one because we just think it'll maybe make money. And it's just, I don't know, it's just sad. Like, I I think the big question people are going to ask is like, can you even watch this movie in a fun way and like laugh at it? I think I laughed at it, but Mm -hmm. I was more depressed about the situation <laughs> than I was having fun. I will say I get why people are like saying, oh, this is another Batman and Robin. This is another Catwoman. But the thing about those movies is that like they make creative choices, like they have mm-hmm. stylistic choices. They're all, you know, I mean, y- you can argue about Batman and Robin and Joel Schumacher's approach or whatever. But like they, they the filmmaker made choices. The thing about this movie is that it feels entirely beholden to the studio in mm-hmm. a way that I feel like kind of saps whatever ironic can't be fun people want to derive from the film. Yeah, like, I get I the sense too that yeah. like Sony is trying to be MCU or trying to be Marvel Studios and the sense that like, well, this, the producers make the movie. Like we just hire the director, like we'll handle everything else. And I think that it's like we're learning the wrong lesson from Marvel. And it, honestly, I think like it, Marvel's had issues with that too anyway, like in terms of, too much you know studio you know creativity over Mm -hmm. like the actual artist you know because then when they actually do relent on that stuff they get a guardians of the galaxy and then otherwise they get an ant-man quantum mania if that makes sense Mm -hmm. sure i like the idea of you calling it quote studio quote creative (laughs) yeah i know it's tough you know it's like it's such a weird and hostile environment that a lot of the creative people involved with this stuff find themselves in so i I always kind of feel bad but it's like they're just trying to make a buck. And I feel like it's not like they're coming to the studio asking for this or that they're, mm-hmm. you know, who knows? Like, I think most scripts are going to be pretty rough, but it's not their job to like make it work uh, oh. at that stage. By the way, what a film the debut that this is the 100th year of Columbia Pictures. I know. Oh, my God. <laughs> was this the first I did one like with that. the logo? Yeah. I like that logo one. quite Amazing. a bit. I did, too. Or, it was a good logo. Unless was Night Swim? Sony, that might have been the first one. I don't know. I didn't see that movie, but I didn't see it either, so I wouldn't be able to tell you. This movie is bombing at the box office. Big surprise. It's made <laughs> $53.6 million and off of a budget of $80 million. But based on reported reshoots and not a lot of marketing, let's be real, but definitely some, the movie's probably going to really, really tank, honestly, uh, especially domestically. So well, rumor has it that the budget is actually closer to a hundred million. 
it probably is based on like yeah when they had to like, the adr alone is at least 10 but yeah no i i i think they're gonna come out with craven and i feel like unless craven is some kind of random hit which i don't know about that could can this stop do can they just not do this anymore please they have such nope. a good thing going with spider-verse those, th- those movies are successful people like them why not well, just do those? Well, you still got Venom 3 this year, which will do very well. And then sure, that yeah. will be their indication to continue trying to do this. I didn't even know they were doing a third Venom. I don't oh, like yeah, any yeah. of those movies. I will say, I, I don't have faith in the project, but Craven the Hunter is directed by JC Can- Chandor, who did like a Most Violent Year and some notable film. Like, it's definitely a, a higher grade director than these movies usually get. It's also apparently going to be a very hard R, which is at mm-hmm. least a little bit more interesting. But it's also like another Joker thing where it's like, why do we need to have an adult version of this thing? <laughs> you know, Put just your like, respect on Andy Circus's name. Sure. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's Venom, too, which I still maintain is better than Spider-Man No Way Home. But that's neither here nor there. Get One the of the more ridiculous things here. you've ever said, quite honestly. Time will prove me right, I think. Or not. I don't know. <laughs> I, I do think that I am considerably concerned about like the rumors around like trying to do more No Way Home type storytelling and like bringing Toby and Andrew back for uh, please God no I I just it just feels like Sony's going to keep making these mistakes over and over again without paying consequences or without changing and it's like it's hard to be that mad because I'm like well at least sometimes they make good stuff but. I don't know. I guess it's up to I I I don't I feel like I sh- shouldn't watch these movies, guys. Like why I didn't have to watch this. Will you and forced yet, me. all four of us did. Well, <laughs> I didn't force you. I just was the like, movie hey, end of the year. I was just like, "Hey, we're doing this. Don't worry. You don't have to come on if you don't want to." And you're like, "I guess I'm going to go see Madam Web." No, I was like, so oh. I, actually no, my wife did suggest it. She was like, "Oh, you you interested in seeing cuz she knew I wasn't looking forward to it or anything and she was like, hey, "I kind of want to see it." And I was like, "All right, I'll oh. go see it with you." I like the idea of like you seeing early to be on the podcast because you said you were going to see it on Thursday and like you don't tell that to your wife. You're just kind of just like, no, let's see it Sunday. (laughs) And she's just like, oh, wow, he's really excited to see Madam (laughs) Webb. It must be a good one. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, (laughs) no, it was her suggestion Sunday instead, because I think, yeah, just the the timing of it and everything. But it's yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's like it felt very weird walking to the theater as a single male alone and being like, one for Madam Webb, please. <laughs> like I'm some kind of Sydney Sweeney creeper or whatever. <laughs> I rolled well, up with yeah. a group of nine people. There were there were like four people, I think, in my theater total. And it was, it was uh, weirdly crowded. <laughs> yeah, mine was weirdly crowded as well. I mean, I saw an IMAX. Fun. Yeah, I saw an IMAX laser. IMAX, yeah. Seeing this movie with a crowd is pretty wild because I don't know about your audience, Matt. My audience did not react to a thing pretty much this whole movie, except for like the woman behind me who was like loudly coughing and like seemed to be having trouble breathing. But like, of course, had like five things of concessions. So like, you know, a joke will just fail like horribly. And you just hear. (sighs) (laughs) (laughs) Well, well. Thanks to this movie, someone would know how to perform CPR. On her. I know, I, I know. Shakov's CPR session, yeah. yeah, CPR lesson is just uh, amazing. No, that thought that's the stuff that'll make this a cult classic. I think. Yeah, maybe I don't know. But yeah, I was thinking about that when they're like detailing CPR. It's like, well, it's a good thing I'm being taught this again because. For all I know, I may need to use this. <laughs> I just like I could see like the Jeffrey Dahmer Netflix show meme where he's like showing the TV screen of like, look at this. And it's like the CPR screen scene from Adam. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's There's a, I mean, a, they're switching. If uh, someone learned CPR from watching this movie, I can't say it's a total loss. So I guess, yeah, whatever. I don't think they would. If somebody so there wasn't on Reddit. There wasn't I think they were an EMT or whatever. They said. The office has a more instructional CPR scene than Madam. I saw that comment. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's how you know something went wrong. And they're um, they're doing the CPR, and after about I don't know seven seconds, she's like, "Oh, I'm getting so tired." <laughs> yeah, I like to imagine to be spider people heroes eventually. Yeah, I, I like to imagine somebody you know trying to recess someone to life, and it's like one, two, three, and then eventually Sydney Sweeney's going to come to help me out. 9, 10, 11, 12, any moment now. 
Okay. David Sims had a funny letterbox review of this. He said, every line reading feels like it's on a Zoom delay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did um, you see Mike Flanagan's letterbox review? Uh, yes, I did. He just kind of repeated the AMC Nicole Kidman speech. Yeah, he just posted the script from the Nicole Kidman AMC promo. Did Was Dakota Johnson's mom in this played by his wife? Or who, um, who's the actress that played? Leighton the- Meester from Gossip Girl? The Oh, the that's who it was. Okay, never mom? mind. Because I, I saw that Mike Flanagan reviewed it, and I, I know his wife was an actress, so I was kind of wondering, like, oh, is that why he saw this? I guess he saw it to saw it. See it. See it to see it. <laughs> And then Brianna said, the Sony Marvel movies are better than like 90% of the MCU by virtue of feeling like they're held together with scotch tape and pipe cleaners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, like that one. Yeah. Let's play the Rotten Tomatoes game. Okay, so there are 209 reviews counted. We don't have a review on In Between Drafts for this movie. I missed my screening and I didn't have the guts to like assign it to anybody else and no one volunteered. So, Matt, who knows? this is your time to shine. <laughs> 209 reviews. What do we think the critic score is? We'll start. We'll start with Chris. Chris, what's your best guess? It's got to be down. T- I'm going to say 13% critic review. And uh, Matt, what's your guess? I'm going to be a little more optimistic. I'm going to say 17 Okay, well, we got 13 and 17. Are you going to do 15? Are you going to be that guy? No, I'm going to go higher just to just to see if I can price is right it my way uh, closer old pal to Dakota. the Dakota. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to say 25%. Jeez, Generous. Well, calm down. <laughs> say, yeah, yeah. You think one in four critics like so this Somebody thing? liked the movie, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um no, but uh, it turns out Chris was spot on, 13%. Ah, and the oh, score changes, wow. like, has been changing like every day. It's nice. fluctuating in the teens quite consistently. All right, but what about audience scores? You know, sometimes the audiences, they can be a little nicer. Hey, sometimes they can be a little meaner. 500 plus verified ratings. This time we'll start with you, Will. Your chance to redeem yourself. Uh, yeah, I mean, are they going to be kinder than 13%? Yes, I don't think they're, like I said, if my audience was an indication doesn't seem like they're super into it was your audience into this matt yeah there was laughter oh really, oh, really? wow that's a uh, that must have been surreal <laughs> well not like like they were into laughing at the movie not oh i see i see yeah i was uh, laughing at the movie but i was the only i saw one. it i saw it in la they were pretty self-aware here sure i'm gonna say 42 percent. okay and uh this time matt serfini you go next 37 Okay, and Chris, Chris S. 49. Correct answer was 56%. Damn. Um, Whoa. Wait, so, so Chris, you said 49. I think that's closer yeah. than Matt. Will, what was yours again? Yeah. Will said 43. I, I think I was 42, actually, yeah. So I was 42. Okay, off. so yeah. Chris, Chris is cleaning y'all's clocks, I hate to say. Killing it. He's um, on a winning streak. All right, and then we'll go to Cinema Score. This time, Matt, you go first. What do you think the cinema score is for Madam Web? Is this the this one's letters? Yeah, like grades. Yeah, from A plus this to is, say this D. Is the folks, yeah, this is the folks in Las Vegas who, for reasons unbeknownst to any of us, determine how we, the nation of the United States, feel about all it these. It makes movies. sense, Will, because <laughs> it's mostly tourists, so it's like rep- more representative of people from across the mm. country. Okay, I didn't realize you were a spokesperson for Cinema Score. We've talked about this. We've had this conversation anyway. Uh, next, I'm... no. Next is Chris Sheridan. You wait. You hold your horses. Okay. Mr. Will. Sorry. Sorry. C. Okay, and then Will Ashton. So Matt's a D, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna say C minus. Once again, Chris Sheridan. It's a C plus. Wow. Okay. Kind of remarkably first. higher than I expected, and Chris, a C plus Chris is, is pretty cheating. bad for a Cinema Score. Chris is Madam Webb. He, he can <laughs> see the future. Yeah. He's Ezekiel yeah, Sims. He, he saw this whole situation. Us all. Yeah. He woke up last night next to an NSA agent. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a dream. It was a premonition. <laughs> it wasn't a dream. I'm going to win the Rotten Tomatoes game. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We'll finish off with the everyone's favorite, Letterboxd, and then that'll be that. 95,000 watches on Letterboxd. Not a lot. Not, not a 
super low, but you know, kind of middling. What do we think the average rating is on Letterboxd? And so this time, start with Will Ashton. Will Ashton, what do you think? What do you got for us? Uh, is it like two point one? Two point one is your guess, and then Chris, you're next. Mm, two point nine. Two point nine, and then Matt Seraf. Two point seven. Mm. Well, Chris's winning streak had to end eventually because Fuck. Mr. Will Ashton, ah. the man, the, the myth, mm. it's a 1.6. Whoa. Which is, I think, the lowest, Will, we've ever seen. That it has to be. I should have gone lower. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I knew it was going to be low. I didn't realize it was going to be that low. Just yeah, because, was, yeah. I don't know if we've ever seen it be in the ones. I think the lowest has been in like the low twos. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I thought for sure the Sydney Sweeney stands would come out in force, and uh... <laughs> it's it's funny because if you look at the like the ratings and everything, you can kind of see that there's 2,849 people who gave it five stars. Obviously, shit posters, mm-hmm. and then not a lot of people give it four and a half by comparison, like 493, and then it drops off and drops off. Most people gave this one star, so mm-hmm. the most amount, 24 percent of the rating. So. Which kind of tracks, I guess. Hey. But, yeah. I gotta say, you know, every movie, as they say, is someone's favorite movie. Somewhere out there, it's maybe not alive now, maybe, you know, sometime in the future, who knows, this will be their favorite film. Why? Hell if I know. But, you know, <laughs> if they love it, they love it. Yeah. You know, the web connects us all, so at the end of one of those strands, somebody's got to love Madam Web. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right, well, that'll do it for our show. Thanks so much for listening. Next week, we're going to be talking about Dune Part 2. Do you think there'd ever be a, a podcast like Any Ogre and they devote a month to Madam Web watching it once a month? I, I would not. pray for them, that's for sure. Yeah, I know, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I'm excited for Dune Part 2. I, already, I reviewed it for In Between Drafts. Great movie and uh, better than the first one, in my opinion. But uh, we'll have a whole on, full-on conversation for that. And Matt, Chris, thanks again, guys, for coming on. It was a blast and a half. It was more fun talking to you two about Madam Web than watching Madam Web. That's for dang mm-hmm. sure. <laughs> thanks for right having back us. Back at you. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks for having us. It's good to be here. <laughs>